I have a four-year-old son. He's the greatest love of my life. Never, not once, has it ever occurred to me that he could be taken away from me. And it's certainly never crossed my mind that this could happen because of the color of my skin. Yet, throughout the 1900s in Australia, the country where I'm from, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were taken away from their mothers. They were forcibly removed from their cultures, their communities, and their families, and placed into government institutions and non-Indigenous foster families under the assimilation policy. Many of these children never saw their mothers again. These children are known as the Stolen Generations. I'm a documentary photographer, and in 2014, I began to work with women from the Stolen Generations to tell their stories through photographs. This is Susan, who was born in the Northern Territory and removed at birth from her mother, thousands of kilometers away, to a family in Sydney. Susan didn't see her mother again for 21 years. Susan said, every day I walk a path of recovery from the policy that removed children from their parents. I was stolen. I still feel the silent pain that is mine and my mother's. This is Jenny, Susan's daughter. This policy had such immense ramifications that not only affected those children who were physically removed and their immediate families, it's affected many generations afterwards. In 2008, the former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, made a formal apology to all First Australians for the profound grief, suffering and loss that this policy had caused. I still lived in Sydney at the time, and I watched the government's apology on television from my Sydney apartment. I watched as members of the Stolen Generation sobbed as the Prime Minister made this apology. And it made me feel many things. But the two dominant emotions were a very deep pain for what the Stolen Generations and their families had experienced, and also a very deep sense of shame that as a white Australian, I'd known little about the suffering of first Australians, and that, as a non-Indigenous Australian, I had been so blind to the covering up of history. This is Caroline, who said, My mother, grandmother, and older sister were stolen generations. I miss their presence and whispers of knowledge, gently, steering me on the right wave. These gaps in my life still stay with me, cloaked in the grief, moving like the tide. This is Jasmine, a young and wonderful mother, who said to me, because of what happened, I'm afraid the same thing could happen to my own child. In Aboriginal society, female elders become known as auntie, this is Auntie Grace. Auntie Grace told me while I was taking her portrait that when she was born, Aboriginal women were not allowed inside the hospital. So she had been born in a shed out the back. I think about having my own child and about how vulnerable I felt during childbirth. And I cannot imagine the fear and pain of having to go through such a difficult experience, not in the actual hospital bed, but in a shed out the back of the hospital grounds. I now live between London and Australia, but I return frequently to Australia to produce my photographic work. Australia is and always will be my home. When I'm away from Australia, I miss the landscape. I long to be back there. I miss the wildness of the place, the light and everything about it. It's the only place I really feel I belong. Yet reflecting on my own past makes me consider how we, as a nation, have told our own historical narrative and the voices and stories of First Australians, which have been almost entirely left out of our historical dialogue for over 230 years since colonization. The historical narrative I was taught focused on the bravery of the new explorers and settlers 
who was seen to have tamed a wild and rugged landscape. This narrative not only served to disempower First Australians, but by disqualifying their history and achievements, it also served to justify the violent actions of the new settlers. When I think about living between London and Sydney, I think about the fact that because I've lived for so many years between worlds, I don't really fit into either world. I live in that space in between. But this was my choice, and it was only my choice. The stolen generations had no choice. This is Lorraine, who wrote the following poem about belonging. Belonging where? Caught in arc abyss. Belonging where? Thousands of children, heartache, despair. Stolen, separated, leaving mothers behind. Lost to our culture, music, dance and art. Lost to ourselves, our families, our hearts. As a child wondering, what did I do wrong? Who the hell am I, feeling so strong? The taunts of a childhood, all a whirl. Half caste, half caste, little black girl. Italiano, Greek, Maori, or what? Some of the questions asked a lot. Too black to be white, too white to be black. Caught in the middle, belonging nowhere. To belong to somewhere, to belong to a community and a group is perhaps one of the most fundamental of human needs. The stolen generations were robbed of this. The anthropologist W.E.H. Stanner wrote about a culture of disremembering which has occurred throughout the history of Australia. Stanner went on to say that in Australia, we have continued to honour a silence which was not only a silencing on the voices of first Australians, but it was also a silencing on any telling of an alternative history. He called this silence the Great Australian Silence. I made this photographic series as a way of acknowledging, recognising and remembering these voices which have been wrongly silenced in the past. As a photographer, I think it's important to continually ask myself why I produce this work. I constantly ask myself, do I have the right to produce this work and to talk about these issues through my art as a non-Indigenous Australian? Do I have the right to talk about other people's pain, which is not directly my own? Another question which I'm constantly pondering is, do the descendants of pioneering generations inherit moral culpability for the actions of their forebearers? Does my generation inherit the moral culpability of what happened long before we were born? Yes, I think we do. I think we have to consider our role and our family's role in the pain of the past. Throughout Australia, the effects of colonisation had devastating impacts on First Australians. One of the states which saw extreme violence was the island state of Tasmania. The ultimate cause of what came to be known as the Black War, which was a war fought between colonists and First Australians, First Tasmanians in this case, occurred around the dates of 1824 to 1831. Colonists claiming the land for themselves was the ultimate cause of this war, but a further trigger, it's believed by historians, was the abduction and rape of Aboriginal women by the white colonists. This photographic series is titled No Blood Stained the Wattle. The wattle is a native Australian flower. This series uses the massacres and the conflicts of the frontier to talk about the notion of deliberate historical forgetting throughout Australia's history. I worked with the research of the prominent historian, Professor Lyndall Ryan, who has spent many years researching the massacre sites throughout Australia. 
I researched each site thoroughly before visiting all of the sites throughout the island. I photograph with a large format camera, which is analog, and I use film. Working this way makes me work in a slower and more reflective way. I would go to these massacre sites and stay in the sites for several hours, waiting for the light to change and reflecting on what had occurred in that very spot many years before. This is a place called Sally Peak, where in 1823, Aboriginal men killed two stockkeepers in a reprisal murder for the abduction and rape of Aboriginal women. Stockkeepers then retaliated and killed an unknown number of First Tasmanians. They photographed First Tasmanians whose ancestors had witnessed the violence and whose bloodlines had survived. All of the people in this series are connected either through marriage or through bloodlines. The portraits in this series are always paired with a landscape and consider how attachment to the land and a particular place is deeply embedded in our identity and our sense of belonging. This is Eliza, who suggested that when I take her portrait, she paint her face with ochre, which is what she uses for traditional women's ceremonies. Well, that, although that particular portrait wasn't the one I chose for the series, Eliza then suggested that perhaps I use the ochre to physically paint on the actual photographic negative. I painted on top of the actual negative and then used nails, fingernails or other sharp objects which I found in the sites of massacres and which I had permission to use to physically scratch through the actual photographic negative, physically inflicting on the negative the actual violence that the same landscape had bore witness to. Our history and the telling of our history has been altered, damaged, distorted and manipulated. Therefore, I felt my images needed to do the same. After painting on the surface of the negative with ochre, I would then often physically change and change the actual photographic negative. This constant evolving of the ochre on the surface of the film reflects our own evolving understanding of history. The next series which I'd like to show you is called The Dark Forgetting. This work is a collaboration with elders from the Bathurst region. This work looks at the Wiradjuri people who were involved with the Bathurst War in 1824 when white colonists moved in to claim the land. This war resulted in massive depopulation of the Wiradjuri people. I was born in Wiradjuri land and so this particular series has a very deep personal connection to me. In this series, I reflect on historical truth-telling and revealing dark, hidden corners of history. I painted on the actual physical photographic negatives and then overlaid other photographs and images on top to reveal hidden layers and the multi-layered aspects of history. All things are personal, arguably, all artists put a large component of self into their artwork. We all perceive life from our uniquely individual perspective. And so all of my work is deeply personal. It's deeply intuitive and comes very much from my gut. Perhaps it's my recognition of the possibility of ancestors' culpability, of the fact that we all need to take responsibility for the past, even if it occurred long before we were born. To be seen, to be heard, for our pain to be understood and recognized is perhaps one of the greatest healers of all. My work aims to do this. My images aim to tell the stories of others and by the sharing of pain and grief caused by an unjust history, they aim to work as a tool of healing 
We all wear history like a layer of clothing against our bodies. Perhaps the clothing moves, the air comes between the fabric and our skin. But it's always there. Our past is always present. And we need to understand this past because we are all a part of history. And if we don't understand it, we'll always remain chained to it. Thank you.